Welcome to St. Mary's Harefield's stream service for Sunday the 4th of April, Easter Day. The hymn Jesus Christ is Risen Today is the hymn for Easter Day. It has a history that goes back to the 14th century in Bohemia, written in Latin by an unknown author. It was translated into English in 1708 and included in a collection of divine songs and hymns known as Lyra Davidica, and it's sung to a tune called Easter Hymn. Jesus Christ is risen today. Let us pray. The Collect for today, Easter Day. God of glory, by the raising of your Son, you have broken the chains of death and hell. Fill your church with faith and hope, for a new day has dawned, and the way to life stands open in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We also pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'd like to go and uh, get hold of a piece of bread, we're going to share some bread later in the service. I'll tell you when uh, that will come a bit later on. Our first Bible reading is from the story of the early Christian church in the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. 
You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder how we tend to divide people up in our thinking. In New Testament times, the Jewish people were clear about how they did so. The world was divided between Jews and Gentiles. You were one or the other. A Gentile could become a Jew by becoming a proselyte convert, but you were one or the other. However, what happens as recorded in Acts chapter 10 is significant in this respect. A Roman centurion named Cornelius has a strange vision. He's told that somebody has a message for him as Simon Peter, who is staying at the time in Joppa, now part of Tel Aviv. Peter also has a strange vision about not calling anything or anyone impure. So there were two visions going on here. As Peter thinks about all this, servants arrive from Cornelius' household. And the following day, Peter sets out to meet with Cornelius, who lives in Caesarea, not too far away. Cutting a long story short, at the invitation of Cornelius, Peter tells him about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. And the response from Cornelius and everyone listening is extremely positive. And what then happens has been described as the Gentile Pentecost. What Peter says in his opening gambit is this. Acts chapter 10 verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. For Peter, from this time onwards, life was not divided between Jews and Gentiles. Jesus lived, died and rose again for anyone, for everyone, Jew, Gentile, male, female, free, slave, black, white, whatever. The Christian church does not become a sect of Judaism because of this. It reaches out to include Gentiles, well, everyone. Peter's discovery is that God does not have favourites. Neither should we. Neither should the Church. We're all of equal value to God, our Heavenly Father. Very important truth to grasp at this Easter season. For from God's perspective, the world is not divided. There's only one race, the human race. Christianity is a global faith. Today, Jesus has followers from every nationality and over all the globe. Peter finishes his little talk about Jesus, uh, which focuses, of course, on the resurrection, in this way, verse 43. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So Cornelius becomes a beneficiary of this inclusive, appealing message of Peter and the early church. Over the years, the church itself hasn't been so good at maintaining a proper, inclusive approach. It's often defined itself over and against those who don't belong to it. It's even caused holy wars, the Crusades, and much division between denominations within its own structure. So now as the world begins to reformat itself, it's a great time for people of faith to reformat themselves, ourselves, to look up to find the one God who is behind life and beyond death, and to look around to see people who are just like us in our common spiritual need. Easter is for everyone. It's like a vaccine available to all at no cost. 
giving spiritual life and protection right now and a passport to eternal life in the future. It's available for us to receive and to benefit from right now. The hymn Crown Him With Many Crowns is a very uniting hymn, but it was written by someone who started life as an Anglican and became a Roman Catholic. Matthew Bridges was caught up in the Oxford movement of the 19th century. He left us with this great hymn, which contains the lines, Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave. The hymn's title is Crown him with many crowns. Today's Gospel reading is from Mark's Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Jesus has risen. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. 
See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. If Easter hadn't occurred, we would know nothing about Jesus today. The hope that people invested in him would have died with his death. There may have been stories circulating about this good man who was cruelly killed, but they wouldn't be followers, they wouldn't be a New Testament, they wouldn't be a church. The central belief of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus. It comes across in Mark's account in a very unembellished way. Less is more with Mark's approach. Yes, there are more verses, by the way, at the end of this in Mark's Gospel, but they probably aren't written by him. He finishes his account here, for whatever reason, very abruptly, with verse 8. Mark 16, verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. It's not a great concluding sentence. He probably did write more, but it may have become lost in translation or transmission. But there's something about this brief account of the women who go to the tomb to finish anointing Jesus' body first thing in the morning when the Sabbath was over, that their, their incredibly surprising experience of finding the stone rolled back with no body of Jesus but a young man in a white robe who says that Jesus has risen. This is the important thing. Their experience, their quite natural bewilderment is easily understood. Over the next 40 days, there would be many who would experience meeting the risen Jesus. This would happen to Mary Magdalene quite soon, as John's Gospel records. But this short and sweet account of Mark, who doesn't mention any of this, is a great corrective to information overload. We as Christians are not people who know about Jesus, who think about God. We come to know Jesus, we to know God for ourselves. That's the big difference. The greatest scholar in the world who knows so much about Jesus is less than the humblest Christian who simply knows him. There's a little detail worth noting here in Mark's resurrection account. The women are told, and I quote verse 7, to tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They are to tell the disciples, but particularly Peter, of their experience and what was sent to them. Peter had made a spectacular mess of things when he denied knowing Jesus on Monday, Thursday evening. But Jesus is more concerned for Peter's welfare than for any wrong Peter had done to him. Jesus is eager to comfort and assure Peter not to punish him. The same is true for us today if we are prone to walk in Peter's failed footsteps. It's worth contemplating that the greatest evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is not the little details of Easter Day which we have recorded, but the emergence, the vibrancy, the existence and the growth of the Christian Church. Something happened to transform frightened and despairing people into new people, bursting with joy and courage. Many would end up giving their lives as martyrs for the certainty of their faith. The Church is still here, after 2,000 years, the world has changed. The world has changed a lot in the past year. Humanly speaking, the church is always one generation away from extinction. May we be bearers of the church's resurrection life and its message in a post-COVID-19 world. There's a children's song we used to sing in church when we could do things like singing along with some actions entitled God's Not Dead, No, He is Alive, which we're going to hear now sung for us. Its fun and its simplicity can express volumes about the real meaning of Easter. God's not dead, no, He is alive.
God's not dead. No. He is alive. God's not dead. No. He is alive. God's not dead. No. He is alive. Serve him with my hands. Follow with my feet. Love him in my heart. Know him in my life. For he's alive in me. God's not dead. No. He is alive. God's not dead. No. He is alive. God's not dead. No. He is alive. Serve him with my hands. Follow with my feet. Love him in my heart. Know him in my life. For he's alive in me. God's not dead. No. He is alive. God's not dead. No. He is alive. God's not dead. No. He is alive. Serve him with my hands. Follow with my feet. Love him in my heart. Know him in my life. For he's alive in me. Let us pray. As we move towards more social interaction and a resumption of our personal freedoms, may the roadmap prove to be successful, a successful release from COVID-19. Lord, please give us full and eternal life. May the international community act unitedly and effectively to challenge the murderous actions of the military in Myanmar. Lord, please give us full and eternal life. We pray for countries being affected by a third wave of COVID-19, many of them in lockdown, including Italy, France and possibly parts of India. Lord, please give us full and eternal life. We pray for those bereaved in a terrible train crash in Taiwan. Lord, please give us full and eternal life. Pray for America hit by another attack in Washington and many problems still with COVID-19 in the USA. Lord, please give us full and eternal life. And we pray for the Christian Church, that it may live a Christ-like life, proclaim a strong resurrection message and extend an inclusive love to those who need to experience it. Lord, please give us full and eternal life. So we pray for those who are ill, and we ask for healing for Barbara Leake, Charles, Christopher Costard, James, John Butler, Lorian Brooker, Neil, Sue, and the Reverend Wynne Jones, and any others we know. We pray for those who grieve for their loved ones, in particular for those who grieve for Trevor Peat and Maud Brown, whose ashes, ashes will be interred today in the Garden of Remembrance. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Most British hymn writers in the 19th century and the Victorian age were clergymen. However, the hymn Alleluia, Sing to Jesus was written by a businessman. William Chatterton Dix, originally from Bristol, became the manager of a marine insurance company in Glasgow. And he wrote this hymn, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, His the scepter, His the throne. Alleluia, His the triumph, His the victory alone. So we're going to symbolically share some bread together, uh, which we've been doing at all our streamed services. It's not the same as communion, but it is a connected thing to be doing. And it says a lot in ways which words can't express. I'm just going to fetch my piece of bread now, if you'd like to go and get yours ready. So I break this bread, we may share together. 
and remember our connectedness. The things of life that we appreciate and enjoy, like bread, food, and all the things of life that bring us joy, but also the eternal life beyond this life that God gives us today through the victory of Jesus. And as we share bread, we're going to hear a tune on the flute. You can probably see behind me some very nice flowers which have been produced for Easter in the church here at St. Mary's in Harefield. And the church is full of flowers. I wish I could show you the whole church, but I can't do it in a simple uh, transmission like this. Uh, but if you want to come and see the flowers, the church will be open tomorrow, Monday, Easter Monday, from 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock. And you can do that then when they're nice and fresh and, uh, and uh, well worth seeing. Uh, Wednesday, church will be open from 10 till 4, and Saturday from 10 till 1. So you can still come down in the week if you would like to, and find some peace and a time for personal prayer and reflection in this lovely building. There is now also a service every Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the church hall chapel, and this will be this Wednesday, a short communion service. And next Sunday, there'll be services as usual at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., and a 10.30 service will again be streamed. The Easter hymn, Thine Be the Glory, Risen Conquering Son, was written by the Swiss Protestant minister Edmund Budry, and it was set to Handel's tune, Maccabeus, from Handel's oratorio, Judas Maccabeus. An English translation from the French appeared in 1923, and it's become a very well-known Easter hymn that is sung Nearly every, sun, nearly every Easter Sunday in a lot of churches. Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun, endless is the victory, thou or death hast won.
The poem Easter by Geoffrey Ancatel Studdock Kennedy, known as Woodbine Willie, was born out of the sadness of World War I, when death was all around him. He was a padre on the battlefields in the Western Front. This death was all around him at springtime, at Easter time too, and this poem was born out of that experience and trying to make sense of it. What hope could there possibly be when death was so prevalent? Easter, G. A. Studdard Kennedy. There was rapture of spring in the morning, when we told our love in the wood. For you were the spring in my heart, dear lad, and I vowed that my life was good. But there's winter of war in the evening, and lowering clouds overhead. There's wailing of wind in the chimney nook, and I vow that my life lies dead. For the sun may shine on the meadowlands, and the dog rose bloom in the lanes. But I've only weeds in my garden, lad, wild weeds that are rank with the rains. One solace there is for me, sweet but faint, as it floats on the wind of the years. A whisper that spring is the last true thing, and that triumph is born of tears. It comes from a garden of other days, and an echoing voice that cries, Behold, I am alive for evermore, and in me the dead shall rise. The traditional Easter acclamation goes like this. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. A very happy Easter to you all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this Easter and always. Amen. So we're going to finish with another Easter hymn that we don't always have. It's the Hymn E Choirs of New Jerusalem, written by Robert Campbell in the 19th century. But it goes back further than that. It's based on a medieval hymn attributed to St. Fulbert of Chartres in France, taking us back to the 11th century. It has very old foundations. This hymn's focus is on Jesus as the triumphant victor over death and deliverer of the prisoners from hell the harrowing of hell was a common belief and a, a strong focus at that particular time. Ye choirs of New Jerusalem, your sweetest notes employ, the paschal victory to him in strains of holy joy. <laughs> 